for those of you who are new to my channel. I have a channel where you can watch me build a house from scratch. Nordic building styles differ somewhat from the rest of the world, both in a good and a bad way. In this video series about different building styles around the world, I thought I'd try to collect as much as I can in these videos. The last video with the same topic, gave over 1,500 comments in a couple of weeks. I have read every single comment at least two times. It turns out that my observations of how others build were both right and wrong. With more knowledge, based on your comments and my own research, I want to start over and do a more serious analysis. I made the first video mostly for fun, but the topic is interesting and educational. When I started as a carpenter I could only dream of content like this. So together with you, I want to gather as much knowledge as possible in these videos, for the next generation of builders. This series only applies to wooden houses, that are more common in Northern Europe, Canada and the USA. Many wooden houses are also built in Russia, Australia, and New Zealand. From roughly the bottom of Sweden downwards, stone houses are more common. In the US, on the other hand, you find wooden houses all the way down to Florida. In Northern Canada and Sweden, log houses are more common, but that is not something I cover in this video. The house I am building is located near Stockholm, and approximately at 60 degrees on the latitude scale, which would correspond to northern Canada. Sweden is a long country with varying temperatures and we have to adapt our houses for it. There are many of you who question the methods Scandinavian builders use. And at the beginning I didn't understand why. But it's simple. We build the same things, but in different ways. I have been a carpenter for almost 30 years, and the methods I use, are not something I invented myself. The only difference is, I am building the house alone, and have to adapt the build for that. My house burned down about 10 months prior to this video. And even though I applied for a building permit for the previous house, which was completed in 2018, I still needed to apply for a new. I thought the building permit took a long time to get, but it can take several years in other countries. Apparently this has to do with corruption. So that it took me three to four months is probably good. Let me tell you how a building permit works in Sweden. I think it is done in a similar way in most modern countries. As I have mentioned in the previous video, it is quite a strict process with personal meetings, many documents and high costs. All rules naturally benefit the industry, which can charge high costs for doing fairly simple tasks. To save time and a lot of money, I did almost everything myself. I have done this a couple of times, and it's very easy. You can actually do everything yourself. The only thing you need to do, is to hire an architect or a constructor, so that the bearing capacity of the house is correctly calculated. Everything else is paperwork. This is what you have to send in. Construction drawings, similar to what I show now. The drawings must contain cross-sections and weight calculations. You let an expert do this. What you do is draw your house and send it to them and they do the rest. In Sweden, you can Google building permits and you will find several that will help you with this. Cost approximately 25,000 crowns, which corresponds to approximately 2,500 US dollars. You also need to make a fire protection description, that shows how to get out in the event of a fire. You can do it yourself or hire a professional, cost about 4,000 crowns or 400 US dollars. The constructor must also provide you with dimensioning certificates, facade drawings and site plan drawings. When everything is approved, you will receive a control plan to follow, which you fill in every step of the way. This document must be available on the construction site during any inspection. During the construction, the municipality comes and inspects critical points such as the frame, bathrooms, electricity, etc. But of course it's different in the rest of the world, like in the US as an example according to the comment section. Building codes, and code enforcement, vary widely across the US. Part of that is because of different soils, weather, and natural disaster risks, but it's also because of how the government is structured. The states have authority over building codes, with limited involvement by the federal government. As a practical matter, the states delegate most permitting and code enforcement to city or county government. Or as they say in Finland. I 
I started as a house founder and bricklayer when I was young. The most common and cheapest type of foundation we built, was crawl space foundations. This type fits well over here, as I am building on a downhill slope. A concrete slab would have been too complicated, and that is why I choose a crawl space foundation. This type of foundation is relatively inexpensive. My foundation with blocks, gravel and concrete cost about 45,000 crowns or 4,500 US dollars. When I compare how we cast the concrete slab for the brick, we seem to do it differently. We usually peel off the entire ground, and then prepare it with geotextiles, and gravel of various kinds. In my previous video, I mentioned that a common method in the US is to dig a trench that you fill with concrete like in this video. This is true to some extent. This method may work well in the southern United States, but worse in the north where they have to build the foundation to withstand frost, and rapid temperature changes. I have never seen this type of foundation in Scandinavia, but I can see advantages of it in a warmer climate, the method is fast, and gives a strong foundation as you can make it very thick in a simple way. The trench filled with concrete style of foundation, is only common in areas with solid well-drained ground. In the northwest we do our foundations more like this video shows. And here's another good comment from New Zealand, there's a similar one from Australia too. The foundation construction is very different, as we have earthquakes in New Zealand, so we need to build our foundations to withstand seismic activity. We sometimes do footings, a trench dug into the ground, reinforcing steel laid on top then encased in concrete, and piles, similar to the American way you showed in the video. I can easily see the advantages of anchoring the foundation into the ground, instead of having it floating on top. Especially with countries dealing with earthquakes. Many wonder why I don't bury my foundation below frost level. I can't, I have rock underneath. The same applies to my water which can only be buried about 80 centimeters or 3 feet. I anchor the foundation to the rock instead, and use heating cable in the water pipe. I pour concrete for the walls, and to get the levels right. The most commented part was frame construction. Until now, the construction methods have been quite similar in all countries, but now it will be different. We can start by comparing lumber. Canadians and Scandinavians usually use thicker lumber, as we have to deal with snow, and need more insulation. We also have better quality of the wood, which means that we can have a wider CC or OC measurement which saves money. A longer distance between the studs, works well for us, as we have thicker lumber. The wood is also of high quality, C24. Let's look at the CC or OC distance. For those of you who don't know, it means the distance between the centers of the studs. In the US they call it OC, or on center, and in Europe we call it CC, which means center to center. In Scandinavia, the most common CC distance is 60 cm, but we also have 45 and 30 cm depending on what we are building. 60 cm for walls, floor joists and decks. 45 cm in the ceiling and when we use 90 cm board material. 30 cm for denser ceilings, bathroom walls and floors. Our CC measures for roof trusses are very wide, and CC 120 cm, more on that later. The rest of Europe seems to have a CC standard of 62.5 cm, their board and insulation are adapted to that measurement. Russia seems to be a mix of the whole world and has a CC standard of 64 cm, which is a very odd measurement. Given that their plasterboards are of Scandinavian standard, and OSB of German or French standard. But Russia is the world's largest country, and borders the rest of us, so it's easy to understand that they trade materials depending on availability. Australia and New Zealand, are surprisingly similar to Canada or Scandinavia with their construction methods, even their CC measurements follow Scandinavian standards. Canada usually takes the best of both worlds, but their CC or OC measurements lean more towards the US, and are OC 16 inches, or sometimes like Scandinavia, OC 60 centimeters or 24 inches, depending on where they build. In the US, the most common OC measure is 16 inches or 40 centimeters. The US is large, and ranges from tropical to frost, so having a specific standard is probably difficult. They also build with Scandinavian measures, OC 24 inches. Canada and the US calls this advanced framing. Not because it is advanced, but more because advanced materials are used, to compensate for the load-bearing capacity. Scandinavians build simpler exterior walls, while the rest of the world is more advanced. We don't have to think about earthquakes or storms when we build, so we're stuck with these old methods. 
This probably includes the fact that we have been poor, and build houses more sparingly. The only thing we need to think about is the weight of snow, and solve it with a so-called hammer band, that helps distribute the weight of the trusses. Instead of hammer band, the rest of the world uses a so-called double top weight, which is two joists that tie each other together over the wall, and especially the corners. This method gives more strength to the corners of the house. But a double top plate cannot handle the same weights as a hammer band, and the trusses must be in line with the studs in the wall. I've looked a lot at different construction methods, and I think a hammer band has more advantages than a double top plate, even in the US. A standing joist that we jack into the wall studs is what we call a hammer band. The function is the same as a header, but it spans the entire wall. Jacking them in is quick and takes maybe 30 seconds per stud, with the right tools. Together with the top plate, you create a type of C-beam that can handle very high loads. With the hammer band, you don't need headers over doors and windows, you can also add an extra header, if you have thick enough walls. And you don't need to align the trusses to each stud below, but it is still recommended to do so. If you need to tie the corners together, as you do with a double top plate, you can do it with a hammer band too by adding one on the long side of the wall. A hammer band on the long side is called rost band, and is used for other roof types and to tie the corners together better. I don't need a rost band on my house, as the bottom of the truss, acts as a reverse hammer band. What if we did both? Let's use this American frame as an example. There are a couple of details that set us apart. We reinforce openings with a king stud, the same way as Americans. But fire blocks are very uncommon. It's an interesting concept, and prevents fire from spreading between the compartments, but I don't know if it would help us as we have OSB behind the plaster, and usually use mineral or stone wool, as insulation. Headers are not needed, since we use a hammer band. We also have a wider CC measurement, but otherwise it looks pretty much the same. Since I am building myself, I wait with all reinforcements so that the walls will be easier to erect. That's why it looks sparse now, but there's a lot more to come. Many people wonder why I build walls without a floor, and there are several reasons. For my own sake I do it to be able to erect the trusses with a certain technique that you will see further on. For practical reasons, it is quite common to do this in Northern Europe. Let me explain. The risk of rain is high over here. The weather can change in a matter of hours. If I insulate and install chipboard, it will be ruined in the event of rain. Many of you say that the floor dries and that there is no risk, but this is not true. If rain gets into the 20 to 30 centimeters thick insulation, it takes months for it to dry, especially for us who have short summers. We are used to working this way. Some over here put the floor on, and some don't, and I'm one of them. I could have put temporary boards to walk on, but I'm used to work like this. For me it makes no difference. Some also say that the walls cannot be attached properly to the floor joist, without a floor, but I think it's the other way around. Each nail or screw goes straight into the floor joist, instead of into the chipboard, which should provide a stronger construction. On the short side, I'm waiting with the floor joists to attach the wall, as it needs to be insulated first, but that wall will be properly attached later. Here's another reason why I don't put on the floor. The truss has to go down between the floor joists so that I can raise the trusses myself. This is probably not common, and a bit dangerous, but when I was younger I learned the technique from the elders. I have received lots of comments about the trusses having too little wood, and that they will probably break from the pressure of snow. This truss construction is probably the most common in Sweden. We've been building trusses like this for generations. And I've never heard of them breaking or even bending, they are really strong. Just like with walls, Americans and Canadians have other methods, with ridge beams, queen posts and so on. We make it a little easier and it works well for us. Our roofs carry enormous amounts of snow, without any problem. What puzzles other countries, is that I work a bit backwards. What you see now is far from finished. I will reinforce the walls and the roof later, as we build another wall, a so-called installation wall. More on that later. 
I also get many comments that I erect trusses without sheet material on the walls. People are worried that the house will collapse, especially when I put a roof before reinforcement. But I'm not worried. A square with triangles on top is going nowhere. I also have cross rulers to keep everything in place. It would take an earthquake to topple the frame as it is now. This part of the build is very interesting, as there are so many different methods. Modern houses, even in Sweden, have plaster or other boards on the outside walls, but not as much OSB as in USA or Canada. OSB on the outside does not work so well in our climates, with our old methods. So we usually use wind cloth, or asphalt board. Instead, many of us use OSB on the inside, as you will see later. Having OSB on the inside, compensates for the structural load bearing capacity, that we lose by having wind cloth or asphalt board. As it stands now, the house looks quite fragile, but when the walls are finished, they will be reinforced, and about 30 centimeters or 11.8 inches thick. We solve the shear loads with the installation wall, that will be added later. When we make a crawl space foundation, we put a vapor barrier directly on the gravel, to prevent vapor from rising into the structure. The plastic also helps against radon gases, that can come from the ground. In cold climates, it is common to cross insulate, to prevent cold air to pass through the cracks. We do it in floors, walls and ceilings. Foam insulation does a better job, but contains many toxins, and therefore uncommon where I am. I think they have a solution with soy-based foam, but I don't know how far they have come with it. Instead, we have companies that inject regular insulation, but it is quite expensive. I have seen that foam insulation is very common in the US and it seems to be very effective. But there also seem to be many who are harmed by it. Laying chipboard or OSB as the first floor seems to be the same everywhere. Our chipboards are small as we have rules for how much you can carry. Otherwise, it looks the same in most countries. In Scandinavia, we rarely use OSB or plywood on the roofs. One reason is that we have a very large CC measurement between the trusses. OSB or plywood would not work well. Instead, we use tongue and groove boards. This takes a long time to lay but it is a very good choice as the house can move better. The correct way to lay tongue and groove boards is as I do now. One at a time so that the joints end up randomly. After a couple of meters I had to change tactics as rain was coming. To speed up the work, I put them in a row. This isn't quite ideal as you get a long joint which weakens the construction. But in my case it's okay. I'll reinforce the underside of the roof later, with an installation wall, that ties everything together. But even if I could use OSB on the roof, I would choose tongue and groove, it is such a much better choice of material, as it can move and let moisture through better. As a roof covering, I will choose black tiles. It is rare to see Swedish houses with for example shingles which is common in other countries. We choose tiles, or roofing sheets, most of the times. In Europe, we prefer and mostly use screws for everything, while nails still seem to be more common in the US. Modern screws, are very strong and usually stronger than nails, so fewer are needed. A modern screw bend, instead of snapping, just like a nail. According to the comments, many countries are switching to screws, as they are becoming stronger than nails. And as usual, Canadians are quick to adapt. Most of the comments regarding screw, came from Canada. As I mentioned earlier, we can replace the headers with the hammer band. Although it is not necessary, I put a double, just to be safe. The reason I do it now is so that I get insulation in between. The vapor barrier has been a tough debate. We have those who think you should absolutely not use it, and those who think we should. It's a wild discussion. I'm on the side that thinks we should have it. If you have thick walls, moisture can get stuck in the insulation. In my last video, I asked you with knowledge to explain why you should have a vapor barrier. There were more replies than I could imagine, and everyone seems to be on the same page, vapor barrier is needed, in modern houses. There were so many good answers that it would take me an hour to show them all. Here is one that sums it up well. Vapor barrier is needed in modern houses, that's very heavily insulated. The temperature of the air passing through the wall is linear through a material. If the temperature drops to low, you will have condensation from the air. In heavily insulated walls that could happen inside the wall, leading to water damage. 
There were also many comments about having the vapor barrier on the outside, depending on the climate. It's beyond my knowledge but it sounds logical. But with a vapor barrier, good ventilation is required. I will put special ventilation with heat exchangers in the walls, after the house is built. More on that in my later videos. This part of the build was interesting. It turns out we're pretty much on our own when it comes to building a plumbing and electrical installation wall. The wall also gives us an opportunity to cross insulate. The wall also strengthens the house's shear, which we miss if we don't put board material on the wall. According to the comments, Denmark makes installation walls the same way, which I did not know at the time. Norway and Sweden do everything very similarly, so it doesn't surprise me, if Norway builds installation walls too, please leave a comment about it. Another advantage is that electricians and plumbers do not have to cut into the vapor barrier when they work. This should be a standard everywhere, as there are only benefits to it and it doesn't cost much to do. We probably don't need to discuss gutter hooks, we seem to do it the same way by attaching them to the fascia. I'm a bit complicated and do it the old-fashioned way, but it's not necessary. In Sweden, it is more common to have OSB behind the plasterboard than without. We have an idea that the walls should be able to support shelves, cupboards and other things. I personally would never buy a house without OSB or chipboard behind the plaster. It is not a big expense. You can also have cheaper chipboards to have the price. There are only advantages to it. In my case the extra cost is about 10,000 crowns or 1,000 US dollars. Comparing the way electricians do their work is interesting. Scandinavians who build wooden houses, always put the cable in conduit, but many countries put cable directly in the wall. To me it sounds completely crazy as you cannot replace the cable if you are going to renovate or repair it. But it is of course about costs. Some countries have solved it by asking the customer if they want to pay for the extra material. But how much can a conduit cost? In Sweden it is about 5 cents per meter. In Europe it's all about saving money, but what about in the US? Listen to this. Lower current, means smaller wire size. In Europe, the wire inside of the conduit are mostly braided, this means flexibility. Solid copper wire is very difficult, even impossible to pull through flex conduit. Makes sense. Thank you for that comment. Just like with electricity, it is common to have the water pipe in another pipe, we call it pipe in pipe, and leads away any leaks. You can also change the pipe without tearing up the wall, more on that in the next part. I'll probably do a part 2 after I get a little further. The kitchen I will build is very American inspired so it can be fun to compare. When it comes to kitchens, I prefer the American style with pot fillers and other smart solutions. So that's what I'm going to build. I think I'll do like the last one. I release a version where I ask questions and show our way of doing things. With your comments, we summarize everything. See you soon, and thank you for watching.